So yeah, my name's Samuel Hager. I'm the project lead for this Habitat for Humanity Central Arizona 3D printing project. Um, I'm an application engineer based out of Houston, Texas. So this house is 2,400 square feet with about 1,800 livable space. The walls are printed to eight foot one, and then it will get a, a more traditional roof put on afterwards. So ideally, in normal conditions, we would be done printing, set up, tear down, printing everything in two weeks. However, we're dealing with Arizona conditions. And so instead of printing three sections a day up to two feet or three feet, we, so maximum you, we can do a meter per section per day. Then we want to let it sit, cure overnight. Um, here, we're just doing one section at a time. And a lot of times, not even up to the three foot mark or the meter mark just because where we're starting printing about 5 a.m. and then the, the temperature rises so quickly here. So we're, we're kind of at a, a third pace of what we'd like to be, but hey, we finished. Today was our final print day. So our last layers just went down. So when we finish, we uh, throw burlap up there. It just kind of helps the curing process. Um, in different climates, we could put plastic foil over it or plastic wrap, but the, the humidity gets trapped in there, it starts to sunbake, and it, it gets so ridiculously hot, up to 60 degrees Celsius, something like that, so it literally it'll burn your hand. So we found burlap is much nicer, you get some evaporative cooling effect, and it, it keeps the material wetter for longer, and, and helps the, to cure slowly over time. So this is kind of my, my favorite wall. So this is something that traditionally would be nearly impossible to construct in any other method. But with 3D printing, it, it really doesn't, the printer doesn't see any difference whether or not it's a straight line, a curved wall, a wavy wall. And in the future, I want to play around with parametric design. So you can imagine having a, a bookshelf built into your wall and not just a normal bookshelf. You could have it come up at an angle sweep. You could have a triangular tessellation pattern. Maybe it's a lobby for a business. You could have their, their logo embossed or something like that. So, there's a lot of room to play around with, with getting a little bit more technical and tricky with, with stuff. Um, the reason we didn't do that too much is this is a Habitat for Humanity build. Um, there's two pads on that side and one pad on this side that are going to get homes with a very similar so style and look. So we want it to fit into the neighborhood. But I believe in the future, architects are going to start to have a lot of fun with the abilities and the capabilities that the 3D printer has. We can get up to about a 10%, 15% in some cases overhang. So um, that's how we'd be able to come out, do bookshelves, do strange patterns. So I, I like the look of the walls where you start really flat over here. And as you get further down the wall, you start to see patterns of form and get more intense. So maybe triangles or you can do a weave pattern where the, they're offset. So it starts to look like a, a, a real thick quilt. So the nice thing about this is, um, you can have your trades kind of baked into your file, into your CAD system. So we know at this, this height and this point, we're going to have an electrical box go in. So what we did is, when it's still soft, you can cut it almost like butter. Um, so what we could have done is have the printer stop here, lift up, move over, and continue printing. What we did instead is just have it print right through. Our tradesmen have their plans out. They know exactly what layer it's coming in at, what layer it's going to stop at. So once it gets up to the top of the, the electrical box, they come in with a putty knife, slice away, and they get a really nice tight fit for their electricity. And as far as getting electricity into the wall, you can either come down from the ceiling or up from the bottom. In this uh, particular print, we decided to come down from the ceiling. So in certain places, you'll see these vertical chases, which are, are opened for our wiring and everything to come down. There's an electrical outlet on the other side of the wall, so it'll look just like that one behind you where there's almost no visible opening. Um, this will all get hided with a, a piece of trim, um, floor to ceiling, and it will it'll blend in quite nice. We went out of our way to leave the layered effect. Um, we really wanted to show off the fact that we are 3D printing a home. This isn't normal. So I, I was talking about how we can print with flaps. So they go down about two and a half layers and it will smooth everything below it. And if there's any extra material, it will fall away and you can easily sweep that up at the end of the day. So you get a really nice smooth textured look, um, flat walls. But 
I've actually grown quite fond of the layered look. Um, I know at first, when I first started, I'm like, there's no way I'd live in a home with this wacky textured wall. But I've been in it so long, it, it really starts to feel normal and it grows on you, especially once you see it completely finished. So it will get a, a thick coat of white glossy enamel paint, um, black trim. Um, I think we have dark colored furniture and stuff like that. So it ends up looking quite modern and um, not, not so brutal and concrete. So other projects we've done, we've plastered or sheetrocked over it and left little accent pieces where you can see the, the, the 3D printed layers. Um, but for this home, even walls where we could have framed out, so like a plumbing wall where maybe it would have been easier to, to not have to snake our print around the, the plumbing chases and stuff. But we decided let's do everything top to bottom, all 3D printed, um, integrate all of our plumbing, to electrical. That was kind of a, a showcase that yes, it can all be done. If you want to add in lumber walls, you can, but you can also 3D print it. So you don't need to bring in a team of framers, even for single walls. You can do everything. You, you pre-plan in your CAD file. Um, you work with your architect, make sure everyone's on board, and you make a print file, and then what you print, or what you have in your file is exactly what you get. And the CAD is actually pretty simple. So my background's in FDM plastic 3D printing. And creating those CAD files are much more complex. You have undercuts, you have fillets, bevels, all these weird offset planes, things like this. The, the CAD file for a home like this is actually really simple. Um, even someone with, with no CAD experience, if, if they look at a couple YouTube videos, they can pick it up pretty quickly to figure out. You start with a centerline drawing, and you can go all the way up. And you can even import a solid model into the slicer. It'll layer it out and, and give you your, your G-code print file. So the same file your desktop FDM printer uses, uh, a CNC machine, is just XYZ feed rate. We also have tangential control of the, the nozzle. So as you print and come around a turn, the, the nozzle will turn with you. So when you're using something like flaps, that's essential, because if you don't have that, your flaps will be dragging through your print. Um, so that, that tangential control is a super big key feature. Um, not necessarily as needed for um, a, a home where you're not doing flaps, but definitely still helpful, and uh, it, it makes your corners look much nicer. So right now we are standing in the master bathroom. Um, back here is where our, our uh, sink and everything will be, and just for inspection purposes and everything like that, we left it extra big. We put a, a thin metal, metal lintel right here, so that gives our plumber plenty of access to get in there. Um, that will all get sealed off, filled in later. Um, and then you have things like this. So this is where your shower head will be. So we, we run our, our plumbing for our shower head down through here. Um, we have a nice little place for your shampoo, conditioner, and then your, your drain is coming out. So like I was saying before, you can either come down or come up. In our previous projects, we came up and then um, I, I kind of do like coming up from the bottom because then you don't need the entire chase. You just need to have a little bit of a hollow gap. And you, once you get to your electrical outlet height, this can all look normal all the way up. So this will get covered. All of these openings will get framed out as well um, for our, our doorways and things like that. But this is a good example. And, and here we have um, our lintel. So a lot of people are always interested in that. How do you do windows, things like that. So what we did, we, we printed up a couple layers the day before, used the putty knife method, cut away the material to set our lintel in, and then we can start our next day with a completely flush print, and it, it looks nice, smooth, seamless. I, this is actually one of my favorite walls. So in, in future projects, I want to add radiuses. So this is kind of a more traditional look where you have 90 degree corners in almost every single uh, corner and wall. Um, our architects wanted it to blend in to the other houses that are gonna be just here in the neighborhood that Habitat for Humanity is building. Um, but in the future, having these nice curved walls which are, are so difficult to, to, to make Especially in affordable housing, you'll never see curved architecture. So in the high-end homes, maybe up in Scottsdale, in uh, the more wealthier areas, you'll see the, these cool architecture features. We'll uh, have arches, curved walls, things like that. So for us, it, it makes no difference whether it's a straight wall or a curved wall. 
So I, I, I definitely want to play around a lot more with, with curved features, um, overhangs, like I was talking about before, parametric design. There's no codes on file anywhere for 3D construction. Um, it just doesn't exist. So it's going to take some time for municipalities um, to, to kind of catch up with where we're at. But this is a brand new technology. We weren't expecting it to be perfect right off the bat. Um, there's currently no one living in a 3D printed structure in the United States. So this will be the first, if not one of the first homes where someone's actually moving in with their family, having a mortgage. So it's, we will get to that point um, along with allowing us to, to load these, these walls. So we have one print, uh, one printed project in Beckham, Germany, where we are allowed to load uh, the weight of the floor and the, so it's a two story. So the, the mid story floor and the ceiling are both poured concrete and that's actually partially loaded onto our 3D printed structure. So that's a big win for us because that's kind of the future. We want to just print up to a certain height throw a roof on there, you're in and out. Um, so for this one, we do have interior support columns. Um, the, the printed wall acts as formwork for it, and then it's poured with a, a thin rebar cage, and then our roof will be seated on top of that. But this, this material right here, um, I don't want to say exact number, but it's over 4,000 PSI, so much stronger than the, the base concrete. Um, it's it's our printer can take any concrete, mortar, mud, whatever you throw it, as long as your aggregate is smaller than roughly eight millimeters, because we have a rotor stator pump that's supplying a lot of the pressure. And if you get really large pebbles in there, it can tear it up. Um, but you don't have to use a rotor stator pump. You could use a piston pump, and then you could put any size aggregate. So as long as you can get it through a concrete hose into your hopper, um, we can extrude it. So this is our, our mixing pump setup. Um, DSS uh, was super grateful to donate their, uh, or their silo. So there's dry material in here that gets loaded out of super sacks. And there's an auger that puts it up into our wooden funnel. And then this machine is what mixes it and pumps it up through the hose. So this is all a, a prototype temporary setup. Um, in the future, that wood funnel and the, the metal dry silo will all be one machine. Our mixing pump will hang from that dry silo. Um, but because we wanted to just get the ball rolling, hit the ground running, start right away, um, we kind of came up with a, a temporary solution with the rental of the, the portable silo, and then we, we built a hopper for our material. Um, so that will all be wrapped up into one, one machine, or one silo, which will be quite nice. Um, there's a pipe flange on top of that mixing pump, so it's actually designed to hang off of the silo. In the future, it will all look much cleaner and nicer, but, um, Hey, it works, and as you saw, we, we have a fully printed house now. So we don't have any numbers. This is our first project here in the US, so we need some time to look, evaluate. And also, we know it's our first one, so there's a lot of room for economies of scale to kick in, a lot of lessons that we'd learn just on this project of, of where we can eliminate waste, cost, time, and um, so we, we expect the price to, to continue to drop. But right now, we are already competitive with, with normal construction. And we believe there's a long runway for where we can eliminate costs. So, so getting a, the ability to, to load the 3D printed structure, that's a, the, the cost of the column, the rebar, that all goes out the window. All those trades go out the window as well. So it's less time, less money, less effort. So we can get in, get out, throw a roof up, and that's where we're already seeing the really big savings is the amount of manpower and the amount of time it takes to, to build one of these homes. Um, so the, the fact that I was able to, through video messages, because all my colleagues are over in Germany, so I was holding up a, a camera, a FaceTime camera, zooming in on stuff, getting trained up to speed. So in those two weeks, we kind of calibrated our machine. I learned a lot about the printing process. We learned about the mix process dialed in our settings a little bit, and then, um, yeah, the, we tore down the printer, sent it off to Arizona, and we got right into it. So it really goes to show you that you don't need years of experience. If, if you're a company that wants to buy one of these machines, you don't need to hire a team of highly skilled, trained people. 
you can get a entry level technician, get them up to speed, get them trained up. And to be honest, when everything's running, it's kind of boring. One layer stacks on top of the next one, which is just like the one before and the one after it. So you start to get lulled into the sense of, oh, you're just kind of sitting back waiting for the print to finish. So you can go home, get out of this heat. 